thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, President Hazleton, <coughs> Senator Wickham, members of the committee, community leaders, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a genuine honor and pleasure to have the opportunities to address wow. members of this outstanding and widely needed organization, the province committee on foreign relations. We need at a club anchored in hope in a city surrounded by progress, in a state that symbolizes strength. Today we stand on the dawn of a new decade in need of all three. We meet in an hour of hope, fear, in a century where each year has been hotter than the last. In an ice free Nordic world, a world full of uncertainty. Our quest for progress and peace must be guided by the rays of reason, even distribution of power, and unlimited learning. Or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality, or greed with growth, only spend their energy protecting their own power. Energy better spent helping humanity solve the big problems and opening art it brings to the world. Mm -hmm. I believe climate change is the defining issue of our time and the greatest threat to the security of this nation and of the world. And the Arctic is ground zero. And it makes sense. Instead of reflecting the sun's energy back into space, the Arctic is, absor uh, is absorbing more of it. In the last de decade alone, we've seen Arctic temperatures warm twice the rate as anywhere else in the world. Sea ice extent has reached historical lows. New national policies and strategies are forming. New species are emerging while others are disappearing. We've seen the discovery and production of new oil fields and renewables. New investment and development of infrastructure. Greater commercial, military, and adventure activity. We witness communities rise and villages fall because of the warming arctic. Last year we saw a record 16 climate or weather related disasters here in the United States. With economic losses exceeding $300 billion, nearly half of the U.S. defense budget, and the most costly year to date. The science is clear and the effects are real. I've seen them firsthand during my travels across the Arctic from Greenland to Alaska and right here at home in Rhode Island where the seas are swallowing our streets and eating away our beaches. And the effects are here to stay in a big way and it's only going to get worse. As global populations rise in the coming decades, so too will humanity's hunger for energy. If we're going to save the Arctic and our planet, we need to act now and fast. An Arctic policy for the ages starts right here at home. Despite the striking fact, investment and workers in clean energy jobs <coughs> are twice that of all fossil fuel sectors combined. With American workers in, in all but seven counties across the country. Despite the fact this nation's renewable energy production has doubled each year over the last 12 years. And despite countless countries <coughs> and communities doubling down on their own clean energy policies and programs, despite all this, the vast stretches of the unknown, the untapped, and the unemployed still far exceed our universal understanding. And no one person, no one community or nation can fully grasp how far and how fast we've come. For the 50,000 years of recorded history of humans, we know very little about the first half except that humans emerged from their caves, creating tools to hunt and fire to cook. And just about 10,000 years ago, we learned how to harvest crops and raise cattle. 3,000 years ago, 
solar and coal started to heat homes. In a few hundred years before Christianity began, humans began harnessing water and wind to power mills. Around the time of Christ, we began to recognize the power of the masses in new labor easing devices. And less than two centuries ago, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explained, explored the laws of motion. Last century, the discovery of nuclear power gave rise to new propulsion, electricity, and weapons of war. Petroleum, natural gas, and coal fueled the growing nation. Only last year did renewable energy surge to 20% of this nation's power. And now if every state succeeds in reaching the sun, we will literally have fueled and powered the nation by the end of the decade. This pace and this progress is extraordinary. We cannot help but create new problems as it solves the old ones of today. Surely the rise of renewables promises great risk, but it also promises great reward. And both risk and reward require great responsibility. So I'm not surprised that some of us would have us stay static or satisfied with the progress of the past. But this city of Providence, this state of Rhode Island, and these United States of America is not powered by those who delayed or dared to be different. We became a great power because of those who powered ahead, even in the face of strong currents. The Industrial Revolution started here in Rhode Island with the building of the Samuel Slater's water-powered cotton mill in Kentucky. Over two centuries later, America's first commercial, commercial wind farm erected off the waters of Block, Block, Block Island. Today, solar farms and wind turbines have emerged across our state with panels and blades as big as a football field. Even brown has gone green. And we've had our fair shares of debates and disagreements, as one should expect from our strong democracy. Energy is the only universal currency. One of its many forms must be transformed to get anything done. From the enormous rotations of galaxies to the forces that part our ocean floors and rise new mountaintops, to the cumulative impacts of tiny raindrops, life on Earth is still the only universe we know would not be possible without solar energy. The quest for clean energy will go ahead, whether we join it or not. And no nation that expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind the race for renewables. The chance to lead this world in this new arena is a prize worth pursuing. And the, and the nation that generates the most clean power, I believe, will become the greatest power. Our day in the sun will come, and this nation should be first. President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. And as we look at the biggest star in the sky to fuel our future, we'll surely get a little dazed at first. But if we stay grounded in our values and work together, we can transform this nation and the world and bring light to every dark corner. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the end of the next decade of building a new modern energy network powered by the sun. Why, why the sun, some say? Why choose this as our goal. All because it's clean, it's cheap, and it's unlimited. And the silicone used to make solar cells is nearly infinite. Second only to the air we breathe. Today's electrical grid is, is old, it's ex too expensive, and vulnerable to blackouts and attacks. If each state just built five square miles of 
solar, solar panels and connect them to, a, to form a giant interconnected grid, we could easily power the United States. This bold national endeavor demands a new web of road centers, transmission lines, fiber optic networks, and power farms. The infrastructure that makes permanent security and economic growth possible. To be sure, this American solar power super grid will cost a good deal of money. In fact, such a proposal would cost around six trillion dollars. But we would spend the same amount, same amount of money anyway in just eight years if the price of oil stayed at about hundred dollars a barrel. Transferring electricity from states that need it least to those that need it most would bring new economic benefits to communities. Excess capacity to neighboring states may help reduce the cost of building new energy projects. It will be, it will be built by Americans for Americans, paid for by a solar trust fund, which is fueled by a fair carbon tax, a rare bipartisan solution. Companies would first be required to disclose climate-related risks. Every citizen will be invested. <laughs> All will benefit. Gone are the days of utility bills and losing power or gas. Something Newport County residents know. First name. <laughs> level of each level of government, federal, state, county, municipal, all will contribute to upgrading the nation's energy network over a 10 year period. Initiated by the federal government with very close cooperation with the state to plan, build, and maintain a state of the art modern electrical system. Now is the time to rethink the system from the ground up. Our responsibilities as citizens of this great nation and of the world does not stop at our borders or at water's edge. And as the sun rises, this nation extends a hand across the sea. Clean air and a livable climate are inalienable human rights. Solving this crisis is not a question about politics. It's a question about survival. No one nation owns the sun. There's no conflict over the sun yet. But its hazards are hostile to us all. And its development deserves the very best from humanity. The rise in competition for rare earth minerals that power solar panels and work in wind turbines, especially in places like the Arctic, demand our attention. Intellectual property rights and the technologies used to capture, store, and transport renewable energy will become more important in the decade ahead. As this new source of energy connects communities and continents, no one nation should be held hostage <coughs> by another nation. All of this will increase the potential for international trade across borders. And whether renewables become a force for good or ill depends on us all and the role America chooses to play in the decade ahead. But it's very hard to project our leadership around the world when we're not doing what we need to do here at home. Common sense and compromise at every level of government, especially in Washington, is necessary. And it's necessary that we elect leaders that understand the urgency of the problem and have the vision and courage to do something about it. For as long as the sun rises in the east, humans will need energy and this nation will need to lead. Our potential rests on mobilizing capital and unlocking innovation that meets, that meets the needs of communities and workers. And the private sector ought to lead the way. The rise of American ingenuity in clean energy and the growth of our people and our economy rests on new investments in innovation, technology, education, research. The kind that allows us to find new ways to store, convert, and use clean energy. 
to do it in a way that still preserves our rich history and natural resources. But we can learn how to use artificial intelligence to manage and defend a national supergrid from growing threats by man, machines, and nature. A place where raw materials from land and sea to be manufactured into products that we can use, that we can wear, and that we can eat. Where we can discover new ways to harvest energy for biomedical devices and transport new products to new markets. A place where we can build and test new green, a new green fleet of ships and new materials to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. Where every student, resident, and inmate can learn the skills they need to fill the clean energy jobs of the future. A place where communities and countries can come together to build principles and policies. Where entrepreneurs, industry, and university teams can take products from lab to market and accelerate clean energy startups. A place tourists can visit and the curiosity of our youth is stimulated. That place is Rhode Island. And I'm excited that Little Rhode is our ocean state. It's playing a big part in making America the world's clean energy superpower. And Providence, this city of progress, should become the heart of a large renewable innovation community. We shouldn't waste any time, but we ought to get the job done. No one should be left out and no one should be left behind. No exceptions. And it should be done during the decade of the 20s. 2020s. And if we're going to do all this and do it right, do it first, then surely we must be strong. On a day like today, we can hope. It takes time and courage to step outside a comfort zone and forge new paths. But the end result is almost always worth it. For as John F. Kennedy reminds us, those who only look to the past and present are certain to miss the future. He had the vision and energy to power a nation to go to the moon. So do we. We should look to the sun and the wind and the sea. Our future is bright and it belongs to us all. Thank you very much and I look forward to our discussion.